comments uh, from our past webinars. And so what I really realized I need to do is do a webinar called Your Questions Answered. And uh, in that webinar, which I will construct and I will uh, promote, uh, we will take all those uh, questions that maybe I wasn't able to get to, or maybe I wasn't able to get to in enough detail and create a webinar just based on your questions that you've had during our live stream. Uh, so let's see, we have hello from Thailand, hello from Brazil, um, Oh, Chris Dolanish from uh, Exit 130 on the Garden State Parkway. Uh, by the way, uh, if you all around the world didn't know, uh, people from the great state, the Garden State of New Jersey, uh, when they reference where they live, it's typically based off an exit off the Garden State Parkway. So I had uh, uh, referenced Exit 172 in a previous webinar. Uh, as that's where my family is from, Montvale, New Jersey. Absolutely gorgeous up there. And uh, Chris was saying he's down there from exit 130. So uh, uh, many exits away, but still, you know, garden staters at heart. Um, okay, so let's jump into today's webinar. Um, today we're gonna be talking about uh, the hatching process but of course, to do that, I kind of need to rewind a little bit uh, into incubation. So we're going to uh, take a quick step back, but then we're getting into this amazing process that is hatching. I mean, this is just one of the most uh, uh, beautiful uh, examples of life on Earth, uh, the hatching of the egg. For any of you who have gotten an opportunity to witness turtles, hatching from their eggs, it's, it never gets old. You know, I, I've witnessed this uh, thousands and thousands of times, and every time it's like, uh, you know, it's like Christmas morning or Easter, okay? You're, you're always just so excited to watch life uh, come out of a shell. Uh, and then after that, we're going to go into our hatchling natural history. So that's the time period from when the uh, hatchling turtle comes out of its egg and then uh, those uh, months uh, or years uh, following hatching, their natural history. And there's some really cool stuff we're going to talk about in there, uh, stuff that maybe some of y'all did not know. Um, we got people coming in from Charlotte, North Carolina, from Chicago, um, and, uh, so thank you all again, very much for joining us. Now, before I get into this webinar, I do want to tell you of a really cool thing we're doing at TSA right now, and that is our turtle coloring pages and art contest. So, uh, my good friend, Matt Patterson of Stone Ridge Art Studios up there in New Hampshire, um, has, uh, made three coloring pages for us. Uh, and then to complement that, I have made three others. All six of those can be found on our website. So go to turtlesurvival.org, uh, scroll down until you see the uh, scrolling slide bar and just click on that link. That will take you to the art contest uh, as well as it has a link for just the uh, coloring pages. So for all of you with kids at home, for all of you who love art and are just looking for something uh, fun to do right now until 11.59 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, we are doing an art, uh, excuse me, on April 24th, we are taking submissions for this art contest. Now, of course, if you're a novice artist or young in age, don't worry. We have uh, different categories in which uh, we will be judging this competition. The cool thing is, is there are prizes. So um, the winners for each category will get one of our TSA t-shirts uh, with the nice big TSA logo emblazoned on both the front and back, as well as get one of our TSA 
decals, which you can stick on your car, your bicycle, your forehead, whatever you may want to do to uh, represent the Turtle Survival Alliance no matter where you are. Uh, so again, uh, check that page out, please. Enter our, the contest. We love seeing submissions. And I think you'll really get just a joy out of coloring some of these turtles that the TSA works with, uh, as well as turtles that are native to Matt's uh, home state of New Hampshire up in New England. Um, so uh, let's see. What did, uh, so Lucas says, for the first time I've incubated cherry head tortoise eggs. Now I'm raising four beautiful, healthy four month old hatchlings. Lucas, awesome. So uh, cherry-headed red-footed tortoise. Uh, so that is uh, Chelonoidus carbonaria. Uh, that's the red-footed tortoise. And depending on their geographic location, uh, there are different types of the red-footed tortoise. Um, so uh, moving on from our art contest, which hopefully you're already getting your paints, crowns, and markers out. Uh, by the way, you can use any medium you want for this art contest. Uh, let's go back and recap what we talked about in Turtles 201. So uh, really generally, we discussed diet, feeding, and senses. So uh, with senses, we talked about uh, the ability of turtles to hear through their tympanum, uh, which uh, is the uh, layer of skin, uh, a membrane uh, that um, resides over their inner ear canal. Uh, we talked about their ability of smell through their nares. Um, we talked about their eyesight. And we also talked about a lot about their uh, beak morphology. Um, so that, uh, again, is their maxilla right here, their mandible right here, and then that horny co covering of keratin that overlays that bony structure. Uh, we talked about different strategies for feeding and the three major groups of, um, of herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores. Um, next, we talked about uh, the difference between males and females, sexual dimorphism. So in case you missed out and you want to know what dimorphism means, di meaning two or multiple, and morphism referring to their morphology, how they are constructed, what their uh, uh, genotype um, uh, allows them to look, basically. So... Uh, the main thing we discussed is uh, different characteristics between males and females. The most common and best way to tell a male from a female is two species, uh, excuse me, two members from the same species and comparing their tail lengths, widths, and distance of the urogenital opening called the cloaca um, uh, from the plastron or bottom shell. Uh, and then we went into reproduction, into mating, and egg laying, and incubation. Now, like I just said, today we're going to kind of rewind a little bit into incubation because we can't fully talk about the miracle of hatching unless we get into incubation a little bit. And by the way, uh, this time I also included some really cool videos um, that I hope you all enjoy. Um, all right, so let's move on. Uh, I do want to answer this question. So uh, Lucas Assis in Brazil asked me this question. Uh, he's also emailed me. By the way, you can privately email me at jgray at turtlesurvival.org. Uh, if you don't know how to spell it, it will be later in the webinar. But he really wanted to know, Jordan, can you explain the process of egg chalking. Okay, for any of you who have incubated turtle or tortoise eggs before, after the uh, deposition uh, and placing the eggs into an incubator, you will notice this phenomenon known as chalking or banding. And that is where the uh, kind of slight pinkish white hue of the egg starts to develop a very nice white chalky coloration. And it, it, it typically, as well it should, emanate from a single source, 
uh, called uh, the minor axis of the egg and then slowly spreads outward until it covers most of, if not all of the egg shell. So without, I, I don't wanna get too scientific in this because it is uh, until recently kind of a, a poorly understood uh, phenomenon as ha of how it happens, but um, I'll break it down into, so when a, a turtle egg is in the female oviduct, okay, her, her, her uh, organ for being able to uh, uh, form uh, produce and move the eggs uh, toward her cloaca, her uh, urogenital opening on the tail. Uh, these eggs are ba basically uh, bathing in uh, uh, liquid within the oviduct. Um, once they come out, they are now in a completely different external environment. So under the ground or in the leaf litter, or even for some of those cryptic nesters like we talked about that just almost simply drop their eggs scattered amongst moss or leaves or things like that, um, they have uh, access to oxygen. Okay, so within about 24 and sometimes up to 72 hours of the egg being deposited, the embryo uh, migrates to uh, what is now known as the minor axis of the egg. And that is where the embryo will attach. And this is on the dorsal or top surface of the egg. Um, it, it can either be at the pinnacle of that dorsal surface or somewhere along the side, but it is uh, typically on the dorsal, the top surface of the egg. Okay, well, what is it inside an egg? So I got an egg right here. This is a chicken egg. And uh, it just so happens to be labeled. Uh, I don't know if y'all can see that um, right there. Yeah, it has a little stamp on it. We're just gonna pretend that that stamp is where the embryo has affixed itself to the uh, me inner membrane of the egg shell. Okay, so what happens is this egg has yolk, and uh, which is the yellow of the egg, and we have uh, the white of the egg, which is called the albumen. Uh, and so the albumen uh, basically takes up most of that extra space in the egg that the yolk does not occupy. So once the egg has settled in place, the albumen, just as any liquid, basically settles out um, and is polarized. So it, it, it settles nicely to the ends of the eggs. So as this embryo migrates to the dorsal surface of the egg up here, there is a very, very uh, uh, thin layer of albumin that becomes dehydrated. So moisture is removed from it. Now, remember these eggs were in a very nice uh, quote unquote bath within the oviduct of the female. Now they're in an external environment that uh, are, in which they are exposed to oxygen, even those minute amounts of oxygen underneath the soil. And uh, so what happens is in that little area where the now gastrula, the little collection of, of uh, cells that is the rapidly dividing and forming embryo, um, dehydration of the eggshell begins. So at, let's just say, again, where is it? There we go. At this little spot here, let's pretend that's where the embryo has affixed itself. Uh, the chalking will, or banding will start to um, basically uh, begin in the center there and move out. Uh, and it will continue to move out as this membrane within the egg grows. And that's called the chorioallantoic membrane. And as that membrane grows uh, across the uh, uh, inside of the egg, it will then pull moisture from the eggshell. And by the way, the eggshell is not a completely closed surface. It is called semi-permeable. So it has pores all across it in which moisture is drawn. And so that uh, chorioallantoic membrane pulls moisture uh, from that calcified eggshell uh, causing a change in its opacity. 
and that is what we call chalking. Now, chalking uh, is, uh, it shows viability in eggs. So take a look at the pictures there. Um, I, I, I set up um, viable next to non-viable eggs for your easy um, uh, differentiation in their appearance. So on the left of that, you see viable, which are nice chalky white. And on the right, you see non-viable eggs, which retain that pinkish hue. And that is because the, um, the transformative processes uh, that are going on inside the egg are not occurring within a non-viable egg. And so that chemical and physical process that happens to the uh, aragonite of the eggshell is not occurring. Uh, by the way, Jordan, what the heck is aragonite? So aragonite is a, uh, a compound uh, of calcium carbonate and turtle eggs are made of that compound. So it's calcium carbonate that is organically re, uh, arranged uh, to uh, create what we call aragonite. All right, so um, moving on from there, uh, this is a really cool video I'm going to show you, but it talks about embryonic development. So this is where we're going back a little bit. So uh, the embryos uh, within the female, they arrest development uh, so that when they are laid, uh, they all are at the same age upon being deposited inside the nest cavity or leaf litter or scattered um, uh, uh, under uh, debris in the forest floor, whatever you have it. Um, and so at that point, they're all at the gastrula stage where that development is arrested. Once the female deposits the eggs and now they are within that new environment, <clears throat> the, uh, the development then can resume. Uh, now with some species, as we talk about, uh, they will undergo what's called a diapause. And diapause is, um, uh, linked to various uh, different factors such as temperature and uh, uh, water inundation. Uh, so think of rainfall or flooding. Um, so what we know is that development is largely controlled by temperature. In 201, we talked about temperature sex determination and the development of that embryo uh, will speed up um, in relation to temperature, or uh, on the flip side, it the uh, development can slow down based on temperature. Now, why is that? Well, this, uh, the pretty uh, easy explanation is that, again, turtles are reptiles, and reptiles are ectotherms. So an ectothermic animal is what is commonly known as cold-blooded. Their, uh, their metabolism is controlled by the surrounding temperature, those uh, abiotic factors. Um, and so when I say abiotic, I mean non-living. So the sun, uh, although of course there's huge fire plumes uh, that are happening millions and millions of miles away, that is an abiotic factor. Um, uh, Cooling temperatures are an abiotic factor. Um, so other things that influence it, uh, like I was just saying, are the environment and then also hormones. So as that little embryo starts to grow, uh, the thyroid uh, will release hormones that can control development of that embryo. Now, the final stage as an embryo is when the turtles hatch. At that point, once they break through the shell of the egg, they are no longer in the embryonic stage. Now, uh, I do wanna show you this incredible video. This is from my friend Hu Qiofei uh, in Beijing, China. Uh, what they were able to do was incubate a turtle egg without the shell on. Now, this had been uh, first achieved in a classroom in Japan with using a chicken egg the year previous. Um, and so uh, Chiofei 
and his associates uh, decided to try this technique so that they could film uh, the development of the embryo. So I'm gonna click over here real quick and I want you all to watch this. This is really, really cool. All right, so, well, I'll go back really quick. So I left you all at the point where the turtle broke through uh, the membranes within the egg because there it was no egg shell around this turtle. Uh, now, uh, why is this technique uh, potentially important? Well, sometimes eggs uh, get broken that can't be repaired, and so, one could, using this technique um, properly, be able to incubate eggs, especially when we think of turtles that are endangered or critically endangered, uh, so that the egg is not completely lost. The embryo and the future uh, hatchling turtle is not lost. So this is, was, is a really, really cool um, example showing the development over a period of 46 days of this turtle embryo. All right, so uh, I do want to move on uh, because I left you all on that video at the point where the hatchling broke through the membranes of the egg. Well, next, it has to break through that calcified, that aragonite eggshell of the egg. So how does it do it? All right, so each turtle and tortoise uh, is equipped with what we call a caruncle. And a caruncle is quote unquote an egg tooth, but it's actually not a true egg tooth. Uh, some species of reptiles uh, actually have a tooth, a real tooth, um, that they use to uh, slice through uh, the eggshell and egg membranes. However, turtles, much like birds, have a caruncle on the front of their snout, okay, on their nose. And that caruncle is basically a horny structure made of keratin. So again, uh, what your nails, your skin, your hair is made of. And it has a sharp tip, and they will use that caruncle to slice through the egg. And I'll actually show you a video in just a minute of the process of a turtle hatching out of its egg. Absolutely fascinating. But just so you know, every species of turtle, tortoise, terrapin, sea turtle on earth hatches with this caruncle. Now the caruncle uh, will fall off in a matter of days uh, or sometimes even weeks. It really just depends on the environment that the animal was is in and uh, its uh, overall developmental stage. And I'm going to get to that in just a couple minutes. Uh, but either way, this is not a permanently fixed structure. Uh, it will actually fall off. It is not dissolved into the turtle's body but again, falls off. All right, so the next thing I wanna get to is hatching itself. Cause hatching itself, I mean, we could do a whole webinar just based on this slide alone, but of course we're gonna keep this fairly simple, but throw in some scientific terms in this. All right, so when you think of an egg cavity, it's kind of like you see in the picture, flask shaped. Now, uh, I'm just making a generalization here because not all turtles, as I talked about in uh, Turtles 201, uh, lay their eggs in this manner. But either way, so when eggs are deposited, they're going to be deposited 
um, at different at different structural levels within that flask or a column. So as you can see, the eggs at the top are closer to the surface and the eggs at the bottom are, well, they're at the bottom. Um, but what's really important to remember regarding hatching, uh, as well as that temperature sex determination, is that there is a thermal gradient. So I'm talking about a temperature difference between the eggs closest to the surface where the rays of the sun are hitting and the eggs at the bottom of the chamber. Um, and so that means that turtles up near the top of that nest can very well be a different sex than the turtles at the bottom. But what it also means is that the turtles at the top will most likely develop at a faster rate than the turtles at the bottom. Okay, so this could pose a problem, but we're gonna talk about how turtledom has fixed this problem. Um, let me see, uh, I got a quick question really quick I do wanna answer from Chris Dolanish. Do they do this on purpose so they get both sexes? Um, one could uh, uh, hypothesize that a turtle uh, will dig uh, their nest in certain locations or at certain depths or structures to get both sexes. Um, you know, again, you're talking about well over 200 years of evolution. And so evolutionarily speaking, that would be the most appropriate for long-term survival is to have multiple sexes within a clutch. So that is actually where temperature sex determination does play a big role. Um, so uh, whether you're talking about two inches in depth or uh, seven inches in depth between the top eggs and the bottom eggs, you are still getting a thermal gradient. And that thermal gradient can be huge. It can be uh, up to nine degrees centigrade. Uh, that's about 40 some degrees Fahrenheit. So a very, very large temperature disparity. So really good question, Chris. Okay, so the hatching process is triggered by different cues. Again, try to remember some of the things we've talked about before. And I'm going to give you all a minute to type in what you think some cues uh, that initiate hatching are. So we'll just take a minute here. I'll take a delicious sip of my Red Bull. Okay, so now I have a num another company that should probably uh, sponsor the Turtle Survival Alliance. Okay, it's giving me a shell, not wings, but whatever. So I'll give you all just a minute to type in some cues that you think may trigger the miracle of hatching. This is where I need the Jeopardy music. I could probably do it myself though. All right, now let me look at some of the answers I'm getting in. Greg says, moisture and rainfall. Greg, you are absolutely right. That is one cue. Uh, that may trigger hatching. Uh, Lalueta says rain, absolutely. Uh, Chris Dolanish says sometimes a change in temp, absolutely. Uh, th uh, the thermal um, properties of the substrate around it can be a cue, uh, as did dancing turtle rescue and rehab. <laughs> Love the name. Uh, change in temperature, so yes, a temperature drop or Conversely, a temperature spike could be a cue. Um, uh, Greg says, yes, temperature change as well. H uh, Lucas says, humidity. Uh, absolutely, humidity can be a major factor in cueing um, uh, uh, hatching. Um, Boris, uh, I love to see, I love to see that y'all helping each other out and giving each other some turtle self confidence. Boris says, good thinking, Chris, I guess. Okay, what about that I guess part, Boris? Um, okay, light, but, oh, that's really interesting because uh, Greg says light, but wait a minute, but they're buried, right? Okay, so in 
uh, in scientific ex experiments. So you would believe that um, gravity plays a huge role, and it does. But the turtles underneath the ground are able to perceive light overhead. Um, and so uh, that also could be a trigger for turtles who prefer to hatch during the nighttime, is not only uh, are they not getting those cues that there's light overhead, but the, also the, the changes in air pressure um, as well as temperature as night falls. Uh, how about hatching activity and clutch mates? Awesome. I'm going to get to that, Greg. Really good question. Uh, it's fascinating, by the way. Um, longer sun periods would probably heat up the ground better. Exactly. So that's that's a fantastic one. If it if it uh, is a nice, bright, sunny day, if you're getting more uh, sun exposure, that is going to provide a more intense and longer duration of heating upon the soil. Excellent. All right. Um, uh, and then Greg says, yes, and longer days would tell them it's the right time of year. So right, photo period. Uh, so the amount of warmth they're getting from the sun is very much intrinsically linked to photo period of the time. All right. So all of those are excellent guesses. So yeah, let's talk about some of those cues. So Hatchling can be triggered by various cues, okay? One of them very much is temperature. As I talked about, temperature is a uh, large factor, uh, a primary factor in the growth of the embryo. So uh, once that embryo has reached its full size, its full capacity uh, for the egg with it in which it is contained, it is now time for hatching. Um, other cues may be uh, that there is now uh, less oxygen uh, in the nest cavity. Now, there's already a very low amount of oxygen, uh, but if you think about it, as these turtles approach hatching, they're at a larger size, uh, their metabolic rates are uh, fluctuating, and more carbon dioxide is being emitted through the eggshell into the external environment. So, with a buildup of carbon dioxide within the nest cavity, it's basically telling the hatchling and the other hatchlings, hey, we are all at about full term. It is time to hatch out of these eggs or else we are going to be in a highly anoxic environment. And so when I say anoxic, I mean oxygen deprived environment. Uh, other things that were brought up were yes, uh, for certain species, especially ones that undergo diapause, um, uh, rainfall, uh, creating uh, moisture within the soil and a uh, rapid increase in humidity can be a trigger for hatching. Um, and then also uh, going into that, uh, again, talking about the pig-nosed or the fly river turtle, um, water inundation is a trigger for hatching. Uh, so typically the eggs don't hatch until the rainy season. Uh, when the river levels rise, flood the nests. The nests are then submerged underwater and it creates uh, a, a very quick change in pressure and becomes a highly anoxic environment. And that, uh, that what that does is stimulate what we call explosive hatching. And please take a chance, not right now, because you're watching me, uh, but take a chance after this to look up fly river turtle or pig nose turtle, Coretta Kelly's in Sculpta hatching. It, 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 you'll see what we talk about by explosive hatching. So yes, those are all great tr triggers. So the next thing I wanna talk about hatching is that turtles will display synchronistic hatching to varying degrees. So that means that the turtles basically time their hatching with one another so that they hatch at the same time. We're gonna to get to that in just a minute more in detail. Um, now, to be able to synchronistically hatch, and this again brings us back to that uh, difference in that thermal gradient in the nest, the less developed eggs at the bottom, 
uh, need to be able to speed up their development so that they can hatch at the same time as the other turtles. Um, so even though there may have been a very, very large uh, difference in temperature between the top and the bottom layer of eggs, uh, typically these clutches will hatch at the same time. Now, if that's not incredible, I don't know what is because the, 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 the sheer evolutionary advantage for all the turtles to be able to hatch at the same time is incredible. So how does that happen? How on earth could a turtle that is weeks behind in development be able to catch up to the other turtles at the top of the pile? Okay, so uh, what we have to look at this is very much from cues given off by the more developed turtles. So as turtles are uh, nearing full-term development, there's a lot more movement within that egg. And those movements will cause very, very minute vibrations through the nest cavity. And those vibrations tell those other developing embryos that uh, there are hatching hatchlings within their group that are near full time, full term. And boy, if we want to survive this whole incubation, hatching and exiting the nest process, we better catch up to them. Uh, the other thing like I was talking about is uh, excess carbon dioxide within the nest and uh, uh, coinciding with then a decrease in available oxygen within the nest. That is also another cue to these hatch hatchlings to speed up development. What's another one? How about vocalization? Uh, so, so turtles um, have been found to vocalize especially hatchlings uh, to one another within a nest chamber. And this both uh, can uh, have implications for uh, developmental uh, progression as well as exiting the nest that we're gonna talk about. So again, all those things will lead to hormonal changes uh, within those less developed embryos to uh, speed up their metabolism so increase their heart rate uh, and then other growth hormones that are associated with that embryo developing. Really, really cool. Uh, and gosh, I, I could talk about this all day, but in the interest of time, well, I won't. Um, all right, so that goes on to our next slide, the hatching process, the most beautiful site. So as I talked about hatchlings, uh, when it's time for them to come out of the egg, they hatch through that eggshell with their caracal, the quote unquote egg tooth. Um, once that turtle has pipped through the eggshell, it is now entering its next stage of life in which we call it a neonate. Now, for the most part, we, also, we do call them hatchlings, but this is just gen a, a general life stage uh, that... Um, uh, the term refers to a period of about one month uh, post hatching in which they are a neonate. Um, and at that time, they start uh, uh, breathing oxygen uh, from uh, that the oxygen that is within the ground. Again, this is a very, very small amount of oxygen. So they have to be able to regulate their metabolism so, the, so that they are not uh, taking in too much of the available oxygen, thus creating an anoxic environment in the nest. Again, really fascinating. I know I'm getting kind of scientific here, but the hatching process truthfully is a, a rather scientific process. So hopefully I'm not losing any of you all. Um, if Again, if you all have questions about this, please feel free to type them in as I go. Um, so once hatchlings hatch out of that egg, uh, they go into this post-hatchling period within the nest. And that can last anywhere from uh, a day, days, weeks, or even months. So 
uh, in some species of turtles, okay, let's, for instance, t take, for, uh, for example, uh, uh, painted turtles, which I'm going to also use in a later example, but painted turtles uh, or snapping turtles or European pond turtles uh, or, or other species that live at more temperate and higher latitudes on Earth. Okay, so a lot of those species, the hatchlings will actually stay within the nest after hatching throughout the entire winter and not come out again until the warm spring rains soften the soil and trigger them uh, to uh, exit the nest. Um, uh, Again, and then going into those uh, hatchlings that experience diapause, okay? They are typically uh, staying in that nest until they are triggered in a way that uh, is beneficial to their survival. Again, going back to being able to get enough food, enough water, maybe avoid predators. Um, and then it's also very much species dependent. Um, I work a lot with some of our North American species, uh, uh, many of the uh, imited turtles, in which uh, hatchlings will oftentimes pip their eggs, break through, start um, respiring with the available oxygen content in the egg, uh, but then sit there in their egg for several days while they continue to absorb the rest of their yolk sac. Um, However, on the flip side, you have some tax of turtles that will fully uh, soak up their yolk sac within the egg. And by the time they hatch, there is little to no yolk sac um, uh, attached still to the plastron or the bottom shell of this turtle. Um, so again, they, they may spend weeks, months, uh, uh, or days in this egg cavity. Now, really quickly, let me show you a video of one of our yellow or golden-headed box turtles, Cuara arocapitata, a species endemic to the Anhui province of China. And this is taken at our Turtle Survival Center. Okay, I didn't mean to do that, but let's see if we can... All right, here we go. Really cool. I love watching this video every time. All right, so I hope you all enjoyed that uh, video there. Um, as, as you might have seen, when this Kuara Aro Capitata, uh, the yellow or golden-headed box turtle, came out of its shell, it, it came out with uh, just about no yolk sac at all. It is one of these species uh, that is well known to absorb all of its yolk before departing the egg. But that is not always the case in all species. All right, so now let's talk about exiting the nest. Okay, um, and my first question here is, can you guess what factors influence the length of the post-hatchling period in the nest? And I know I kind of cheated because I gave you some of them before, but again, the hatchlings sitting in the nest. Uh, what do you think are influences for them, uh, whether they come right out of the nest whether they wait days, weeks, or months. Uh, and this also, uh, because I said some of them before, is also a quiz to see if you're listening. So I'm gonna give you all a uh, minute to give me some of those factors that would cause hatchlings to stay in the nest for some duration of time. So Boris says daylight. Um, uh, so yes, that's excellent, your photo period. Photo period is extremely important to uh, uh, numerous uh, taxa of animals uh, of all types and especially for uh, your reptiles and amphibians, your, uh, your herpetofauna, your ectotherms. Uh, Kelly says, does weather have anything to do with it? 
Absolutely. Uh, weather, uh, so whether that be uh, cooling temperatures, whether that be warming temperatures, whether that be rainfall, uh, changes in the uh, atmospheric pressure, all absolutely have uh, are influencing factors on the time the turtles stay in the nest. Um, T.C. Hobson says cold temperatures. Yeah, as uh, again, if let's just say again, you're a turtle in a northern climate. Your the eggs are laid in June. They take two to three months to hatch. Now it's already fall or autumn. Uh, temperatures start decreasing rapidly. Well, that might not be the best time uh, for survival of that hatchling for it to exit the nest. Now, that doesn't mean it they won't. Um, oftentimes, we find with these turtles that will overwinter in the nest that uh, sometimes up to 50% of them uh, will actually exit the nest uh, during the uh, late summer or autumn. Uh, while another 50% of the clutches uh, may stay underground and not come out until the following spring. Uh, Boris says sea turtles, low tide uh, versus high tide. Uh, so absolutely. Um, that A lot of that has to do with um, your, uh, again, your moonlight. It has to do with uh, pressures on the soil by the tides. Uh, which very much influence, uh, influence humidity. It influences uh, the atmospheric pressure uh, and, of course, the humidity uh, that is being um, observed within the egg chamber. All right, let's get a couple more guesses, and then I will move on to that really cool thing that we call synchronistic departure, in which I'm also going to show you a video. All right, maybe another guess or two. Again, I will take a quick sip of, well, it's my last sip of my Red Bull, so I'll get the final piece of shell from this. Okay, it's not giving me wings. It's giving me uh, keratin and scoots. And then now I need to move on to water. All right, I don't, there's also a delay, but I don't see any more guesses coming in. So, Let's move on just in the interest of time to synchronistic departure of uh, turtles from the nest cavity. Uh, now this is typically observed in turtles um, and there are numerous reasons why they would all wanna come out at the nest at the same time. Uh, and while you think about it, cause this is my next guess, is why would turtles want to come out of the nest at the same time? I am going to play this video. Uh, now this video comes from our field program in Sumatra, uh, one of the larger islands of Indonesia. And it is part of our project to restore the populations of the painted terrapin, Batiger borneoensis um, on that island. So I'm gonna play this here. These are little hatchling, Batiger borneoensis, the painted terrapin, coming out of their nest. Uh, as you can see, they are playing a little game of follow the leader. <laughs> Oops, there was, uh, that one fell down. Uh, but this is what we are looking at with synchronistic departure of the nest cavity. All right, so Greg says, less chance of one being lunch. Absolutely. Um, Dancing Turtle Rescue and Rehab says, a better chance some of them make it to the water before being predated. So yeah, um, turtles have lots of predators. So those guesses are fantastic because if turtles come out of the nest en masse, uh, basically you're looking at survival in numbers. Okay, if there are predators about, um, all those hatchlings coming out at one time gives uh, the group of hatchlings a better chance that maybe one, maybe two or more hatchlings survive uh, the predators um, finding uh, their whereabouts as they scavenge at night. Exactly, so Luke says, if they come out one by one, a predator could pick them off one after another. Exactly. Uh, 
if they leave that cavity, the predator can just sit there and pick one off. But if they're all coming out at the same time, there is at least a chance that some of them will be able to make it um, past the predators. And whether that be make it into thick grass of surrounding vegetation, whether that means make it into the river nearby or pond, or whether that means like a sea turtle entering the ocean before the uh, terrestrial or semi-aquatic predators can get to them. Um, Greg says, yeah, it's the most dangerous point of their lives. Uh, make the most of it. <laughs> exactly. Make the most of it. Come out of that nest cavity as quickly and abruptly as you can because this part of their lives is extremely dangerous. Okay, I've got another one for you. What about energy? Okay, imagine you are underground. I hope this doesn't ever happen to any of you, but imagine you're buried alive, so to speak. Well, hatchling turtles in a nest cavity are uh, quote unquote buried alive. They have to make it up to the surface uh, eventually so that they can start their next phase of their life and also so they can start respiring in larger uh, quantities of uh, oxygen. Uh, well, uh, the thing is, is that if you are buried alive and it's just you under there, it takes a lot of your energy to be able to dig up out of the soil. Okay, I'm not really talking from personal experience here, but I've watched a lot of movies, okay? Uh, but uh, so what happens is, is if you're using all your energy in the muscles, you're gonna start building up lactic acid. And that uh, lactic acid is going to start wearing your body down. It's going to inhibit use of those muscles. Um, uh, and then you're also then going to start uh, using more oxygen in your bloodstream to compensate. Well, so what if all the turtles are hatching at the same time? Uh, that means that there is less energy being used by each hatchling to come out of the ground. Just like if you are uh, uh, coming up from the ground with a bunch of your friends, again, I hope none of you ever get buried alive and mass, but if you do, it's probably best to have some of your friends along so that you can dig your way out, okay? So that is just to uh, basically make an analogy between you, a group of friends, and uh, a, a group of hatchling turtles under the ground. And why is that? Because once those turtles get out of the ground, they need as much energy reserves as possible to uh, make it past the danger zone of predation. Uh, and, and we're talking about things like skull, uh, skulls, not skulls, gulls, uh, skunks. I mixed those, I added those two together. Uh, raccoons, foxes, crows, uh, snakes, uh, crabs. Uh, I mean, all sorts of things uh, are predators of hatchling turtles. Uh, because once they are out of that nest, they are on their own for survival, okay? There is uh, very little to no parental care uh, in the, uh, for uh, pr the majority of turtles and tortoises, there is no parental care. Uh, some research in the past several years have shown that there is some degree of parental care with certain species of aquatic turtles. Um, a fascinating work that has uh, happened uh, down in uh, Brazil, uh, working with the uh, giant river turtles uh, there in Brazil of the genus Podocnemis, and um, uh, in which the adult turtles will actually communicate with the hatchlings underwater and help lead them to uh, the best foraging places uh, and the best places to hide. So uh, for, for years and years and years, uh, we believe that there was no parental care amongst uh, turtles and tortoises, but new research is showing that at least amongst certain groups, uh, parental care in, in the form of um, uh, of leading them uh, to safety and to foraging areas 
does indeed occur. Uh, all right. So the next life stage happens when this turtle leaves the nest. Uh, and that post-nest activity is very much species and environmentally dependent. So uh, because of those factors, uh, a hatchling has four primary objectives. And here comes my next question for you all to answer. What do you think are the four primary objectives for a hatchling turtle in its next life stage. So again, a little bit of uh, Jeopardy music as you all think about those four primary objectives, and then we're gonna get to them. So uh, we have, um, let's see, so we, Do we have anybody coming in with some answers? Sorry, my earpiece was just messing up for a second there, trying to fix it. All right, so any guesses coming in? I know there's a time delay, but what would the four primary objectives for a hatchling turtle be? Again, I'll, I can provide some music to help you all. All right. Oh, man, they are coming in fast and furious. All right. So shelter. Absolutely. Uh, shelter, food, water, air. Those all sound great to me. Kelly says food, water, and shelter. Bada bing, bada boom. Those sound really good. Um, Dancing Turtle Rescue and Rehab says to eat, to hide from predators, and to grow. Okay. Uh, Bo Bora says food and water source. Uh, Lalaweta's one says protection, eat, heat, water, if terrestrial. Uh, Claire says to avoid predation. Eric says to survive another day. Sounds like a, uh, a James Bond movie there. Um, Lucas says feeding, basking, escaping from predators, and growing fast or quickly. Uh, Boris says for sea turtles getting out into the Gulf Stream. Uh, and then Greg says, oh, yes, Food, uh, basking and temperature regulation. Uh, uh, Luke says water, food, shelter, heat. These are all fantastic. You all are doing a really good job. And, and for, the, for the most part, you are on point. There is one that is so far missing from everyone's answer. Um, but it is kind of in line with some of them. Uh, Greg's Turtle Haven, oh gosh, Greg, says, to complete construction of the Death Star. Yeah, I'll bet if the turtles had a Death Star, uh, they would be having a lot less problems right now, right? Uh, they, they kind of uh, would have some leverage. Space Program Turtle. Uh, <laughs> Greg says that Greg's got it. So Greg is helping Greg. I love that. Greg for Greg. All right. So uh, Emily says, yep, that's it. All right. So it seems like a lot of people are liking this turtle Death Star idea. So let's get to them. All right. So uh, during the hatchling and juvenile phases, uh, turtles, uh, that stage is often to, referred to as the lost years because this is often a time period in which it is very hard to find or see hatchling turtles. Uh, now, I know for us in the southeastern United States, during the month of March, observing basking uh, turtles is very, very commonplace. And, and I do mean uh, basking hatchling turtles. But then all of a sudden, April comes along and whew, they are gone. So what happened to all of them? Where did they go? I have some different hypotheses on uh, where they went. Um, but what I do want to get to is what are those four primary objectives during these life stages of hatchling and juvenile life stage? So uh, number one, hide. 
like we were just talking about, turtles have lots of predators. You know, it depends on what turtle species you're talking about, but for the most part, turtle hatchlings are small. Um, looking at some of the smallest hatchlings, like those of the uh, uh, chinosternids, uh, your mud and musk turtles, that may be only the size of a, um, of a small coin, um, to some of the larger hatchlings, like uh, from the genus Heosemis, like your spiny turtle, your Asian spiny turtle, Heosemis spinosa, in which the hatchling is uh, rather large. Uh, no matter how large or small the hatchling is, they have got to hide because no matter the size, there is going to be some type of predator uh, that can eat them. So hiding is extremely, extremely important to survive to your next day of life. Uh, next from that would be feeding, okay? You of course have to get food in your body uh, for your metabolic processes to occur and especially for growth. The hatchling phase is a very dangerous time as we talked about. So it is in that hatchling's uh, uh, best interest for survivorship to get out of that hatchling phase as quickly as possible. Now, of course, that depends on environmental and physiological factors, uh, like you all have talked about, you know, the availability of water, the availability of food, uh, how warm it is, how cold it is, um, uh, you know, different climactic conditions uh, going on. But for the most part, again, uh, growth, uh, uh, you know, uh, is super important. So feeding is a big one. Thermoregulation, again, that really ties into growth, but thermoregulation is super, super important because a turtle to be able to have homeostasis, which is basically the act of cellular living, okay, the ability of the animal to remain alive, um, is, is based on thermoregulation for these cold-blooded animals, these ectotherms. Um, also, their metabolism, okay? Uh, their metabolism is governed, okay, or regulated by thermoregulation. Uh, if a uh, hatchling turtle stays in a cold environment for uh, the, uh, the duration of its lifespan, there is very little chance of it ever moving out of hatchling size. Uh, it is not able to um, uh, create those metabolic pathways, uh, which lead to growth and uh, uh, building of musculature and other functions. Um, so thermoregulation is super important. Now, along with thermoregulation, uh, in our next webinar, Turtles 401, we're going to be talking about uh, some of the other factors such as UVB light um, uh, that may affect this uh, growth and the growth of the shell. Uh, but the last one that nobody actually brought up, but what's very important is the development of a home range. So uh, for a hatchling to survive to adulthood, developing that home range is critically important um, because it is uh, the, uh, the place in space in which they will uh, find these areas to thermoregulate, to find food, to hide, to find water, and then eventually to uh, interact with other species of their kind, uh, which leads to mating, reproduction, and the uh, circle of life, as, uh, as the Lion King taught us many, many years ago. All right, so moving on, uh, with uh, especially with uh, the hatchling uh, and the juvenile life stage is the ability to navigate. Do you all ever think about this? Do you ever think about a hatchling turtle, okay, this big, like one inch long or 2.5 centim uh, centimeters for all you using the metric system, uh, 
its ability to navigate over long distances to get to uh, the environment in which it will be able to live and grow. All right, let's take a look at this because it, it's so fascinating. All right, so I took a, a picture off of Google Earth, thanks Google, um, of a pond that is relatively near where I grew up in the Hudson Valley of upstate New York. And if you look um, uh, south of that pond, you have this nice open area across the woodland uh, that would serve as a prime nesting area for animals like painted turtles, the little turtle you see pictured, or maybe snapping turtles, or, um, uh, or uh, musk turtles, or mud turtles, um, uh, maybe a couple other species uh, mixed in there. Either way, it serves as a really nice open nesting area. But look at what distance that is from the pond. That is uh, uh, eight tenths of a mile away or 1.3 kilometers away. All right, so imagine when this little hatchling turtle comes out of the nest, take a look at the picture on the left. That's, that's what they're looking at, okay? You have to remember, they're not as high as we are. They're not as high as some other animals are, and they dang sure aren't able to fly like a bird can. So they have to be able to somehow at about one inch in size or so, navigate all the way to that water body in which their uh, mother came uh, to be able to uh, move on to the next phase of life. Now, there are many different scenarios we can talk about because we could talk about turtles and tortoises that live in the desert. We could talk about turtles and tortoises that live in uh, um, or, or in terrestrial habitats, semi-aquatic habitats, sea turtles in the ocean. I've just chosen to use uh, this um, painted turtle, this primarily aquatic turtle living in upstate New York as my model. So if you look at 1.3 kilometers or uh, eight tenths of a mile, that is 51,000 times the length of that hatchling turtle. So at ground level, when it's basically like the movies, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, all these animals are able to do is really see what's right in front of them and what's right overhead of them. So how on earth do they navigate going through fields, going through woods, going through maybe agricultural plots, going through pastures, uh, going through swamps to get to this pond where a hatchling painted turtle uh, innately uh, makes its home. All right, this is an opportunity for you all to guess again. So I'm gonna give you all just a few minutes because uh, I would love to hear some guesses on how you think hatchling turtles are able to navigate from the location in which they exited their nest to the proper habitat. And that's really important right there, proper habitat uh, for them to create a home range, thermoregulate, feed, and hide. All right, so Boris says, uh, are they able to navigate a mental map using the magnetic field, the sun, the tide, the reflection of moonlight on the water differs from land? Boris, those are all awesome guesses. Uh, Gre Greg says, can they smell the pond? Greg, I think you're onto something, something stinky. Uh, uh, Dancing Turtle Rescue and Rehab. I rehab painted turtles in upstate New York. This is fascinating. Hey, awesome. Hey, what part of upstate New York? I want to know. So I grew up uh, in West Point uh, on the uh, United States Military Academy's uh, installation there. Uh, an amazing place to grow up because there was just endless woodlands. There was swamps. There was ponds. There was streams. I could find all sorts of salamanders, frogs, toads, turtles, you name it. Um, Greg says, 
going downhill and hoping for the best. <laughs> Love your answer. Hey, but that actually, it's, it's really not that bad of an answer. Um, Emily says magnetic fields. Okay, so another excellent guess from Emily. Uh, Lucas says uh, smelling. So yeah, sense of smell. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, so, okay, so you're in the Adirondacks. So you're uh, further upstate a bit. Um, oh, I love it. The, it, it I don't know. If, if y'all haven't been to upstate New York, uh, get a chance to go there. I know when people think of New York, they think of New York City. And by the way, that is my favorite city on earth. I love New York City. But get a chance if you're visiting New York, you know, take a rental car. No, not right now. Okay. There's a pandemic going on. But get a rental car, take a bus, you know, take a bicycle, get on a motorcycle. Uh, and go up to upstate New York, to the Hudson Valley, to the Adirondacks. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, it's one of the most gorgeous places uh, you'll ever see. Uh, Luke says, I'm up in Potsdam. Luke, do you go to uh, Clarkson University? Or are you just in Potsdam because you feel like freezing your keister off? Uh, either way, hey, we got turtle species up in Potsdam, so power to you. Um, Chris says, I want to go to Lake George this summer. Uh, good call, Chris. I've been to Lake George many times when I was a youngster. Um, so yes, make some time. I mean, the, the, uh, upstate New York, um, uh, and then going into, you know, Western Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, just incredible, uh, because all of that area was covered in glaciers during the last ice age. It is just pockmarked with uh, ponds and lakes, uh, just gorgeous. And uh, that's where I first fell in love with turtles, especially with the painted turtles uh, and the snapping turtles and musk turtles up there. Um, uh, <laughs> Boris questions Potsdam, Germany. So apparently there's another Potsdam. Um, uh, let's see, dancing turtles says Shroon Lake, but I get turtles from Saratoga to Plattsburgh. Okay, I'm familiar with all those areas. Luke says, yes, I do, graduating in May. Um, awesome, so uh, Luke, I had actually back when I was in high school, uh, uh, over 20 years ago, I know you, what you're all thinking, no way were you in high school over 20 years ago, and uh, I was. I just uh, love to moisturize, okay? Olay Regenerous is my moisturizer of choice. Um, but, uh, but either way, so, uh, so I, I actually looked at Clarkson University as one of my choices because of course I loved upstate New York. Uh, I'm an ice hockey player and uh, Clarkson looked like a good school to go to. Uh, I ended up not going there, but uh, eh, c'est la vie. All right, so let's move on because a lot of you all have given, given answers. And while we're talking about this, I am first going to play a cool video. This is from our program on the Shambhal River of India. Um, India is our largest and most comprehensive uh, of our programs at Turtle Survival Alliance. And this particular program on the Shambhal is for the roofed turtles, your red crown roof turtle and your three stripe roof turtle, uh, both critically endangered species which inhabit the Shambhal. Um, um, moreover, the Shambhal is the last stronghold for the critically endangered red crown roof turtle. Uh, so I do wanna play you a video really quick. If you all look, Way, way off in the distance is the Shambhal River. And these are hatchlings who are immediately coming out of their nest and boom, they are heading straight to the water. Okay, video, come on little buddy. There we go. Beautiful sight, hatchlings leaving the nest and heading towards the mighty Shambhal River. I don't know if you all can hear on your end, but there is actually music uh, on this video. And if you can hear it, it is one of my favorite soundtracks. It is the uh, tryout soundtrack from the movie Rudy. 
uh, bar none, the best sports movie ever made. If you haven't seen Rudy, you better watch Rudy. All right, so let's get into how turtles navigate. So one, sight. Uh, turtles do have a pretty good sense of sight. Uh, there is some uh, evidence to show that turtles uh, may use celestial navigation. So reading the stars, uh, you know, looking at constellations, Orion's belt, Pegasus, um, uh, just like we do in the night sky. Um, also being able to, let's say, if they uh, were uh, born on a hill and they have an open sight line, being able to see water off in the distance. So sight is one of those ways in which turtles can navigate. Another way a, a hatchling turtle na can navigate, like some of you said, is smell. Uh, turtles have a fairly good sense of smell. Now it's not at the level of like a dog or a pig, um, but they do have a fairly good sense of smell. And so being able to smell um, you know, the different gases maybe that are given off by their habitat of choice. So uh, um, uh, methane or um, uh, being released uh, from swampland or uh, peatland um, or sulfur release from maybe a tidal marsh or another type of wetland. Uh, maybe they're able to uh, smell um, <clears throat> some of the uh, 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 aromas from certain species of plants that uh, take root in the habitats in which they live, and they just instinctively know to head towards those areas. Um, those are uh, some ways, or maybe, you know, the smell of salt in the air. Uh, so for your uh, brackish, your estuarine, your uh, seafaring uh, turtles, the smell of salt in the air uh, is something. Um, all right, uh, next, humidity. That is a very big one. For turtles, uh, hatchling turtles, they are looking for uh, micro uh, habitats in which to hide and live during those young years. Um, it, humidity is also extremely important for the growth of their shell, um, a, a, as well as other metabolic processes, getting moisture. And so humidity is a very big factor. Also, um, as you approach, let's say, a lake, a pond, a swamp, a stream, there is going to be an increase in the ambient humidity, uh, the environmental humidity in that area. And so uh, turtles can pick up on those gradients in, uh, or changes in humidity in the atmosphere. Um, also topography, really important, the lay of the land. Okay, if, if uh, hatchlings are on the ground level, um, uh, we believe that, yes, they can uh, pick up those minor changes or even in some case major changes in topography that would lead them instinctively to the habitats in which they reside as juveniles and adults. So uh, just think of it as taking a hike in the woods, you enter a ravine. Well, what does a ravine tell you? It tells you that most likely water uh, is or at some point will be th flowing at the uh, bottom most point uh, of that ra uh, ravine. And so the turtles uh, and other animals can pick up on this as well. And so they know that that will lead them to uh, either flowing water or an area that at some point has flowing water, which will possibly then lead them to a larger habitat in which to reside. Um, air pressure. Okay, so again, when you're moving amongst habitats, um, there are different pressures in the air over these habitats. Uh, you're also talking about uh, micro uh, climates and microbiome. So air pressure is one thing that these hatchlings and turtles can use. And lastly, the thing that many of you said was uh, the Earth's magnetic field. So yes, it is... 
Um, it has been studied. It is, uh, it is greatly believed that turtles are able to use the magnetic orientation of the earth uh, to be able to act as basically a blueprint for guiding them in the direction in which they need to go uh, to continue their life. Now, how do they do that? Uh, well, it is believed that they have a neural magne <coughs> excuse me, magnetoreception system. Um, this is still uh, not very well understood in turtles, but again, think of it, think of other animals like birds, like uh, dolphins and whales, um, uh, like big cats or other things that are able to uh, travel very, very long distances and make it back to the exact point in which they came from uh, or which they are returning to. So all fascinating, so cool. All right, well, I hope you all have enjoyed Turtles 301. Uh, please stay tuned for Turtles 401, where we're going to talk about growth of those hatchling, juvenile, sub-adult, and then adult turtles, and all the things associated with it. And then we're going to talk about age and longevity of turtles. I know I said I was actually going to talk about all of these things in the, ne in the next webinar, being this webinar, but uh, uh, for uh, time's sake, because these are rather complicated processes, uh, I did want to break them down into different webinars. That being said, if you didn't catch my original webinar, Transforming Passion for Turtles into Effective Conservation Action, tomorrow uh, I am honored to be kicking off the National Biodiversity Teach-In. If you want to watch that webinar, go to turtlesurvival.org. Again, go to the, uh, the scrolling slideshow and click on the link for the National Biodiversity Teach-In. That will take you to the uh, Zoom link for this webinar, and uh, then you all will be able to catch that presentation in real time and be able to submit real-time questions and get real-time answers. Uh, so, is there any turtle questions um, that you might have? Uh, we just have a couple minutes left, so uh, I do want to get to any questions that you might have about these topics we discussed today that maybe I didn't get to, or maybe that just popped into your turtle-loving head. So, I'll give you all just a minute, and then we're going to get to some turtle questions. All right, a uh, number of people saying thank you very much. Hey, no, thank you for turning in again, uh, excuse me, tuning in because you know you all make it what it is. This is very much a, a Q and A session and I love to have you all tuning in. And it also just means that there are more turtle lovers out there and that's something that just, it warms my little turtle heart. All right, most people are saying thank you for this one, so there might not be any questions, but I will give it another Jeopardy minute. So, without further ado. All right. Uh, uh, let's see. Greg says, are there any updates on that one species in China? There were only a few left and they only have a male in captivity. Okay, Greg, so you are talking about the Yangtze giant softshell turtle known uh, scientifically as Raphidus swinhoi. Uh, that is the most endangered freshwater turtle on earth. We know that there are three specimens one male residing at the Suzhou Zoo in China, and the other uh, two residing in two large lakes, uh, Zhuang Khan and Dong Mo Lakes in Vietnam. Uh, I don't have any more updates for you now uh, regarding uh, the effort to capture the turtles in Vietnam, but as soon as I do, I will make sure that that is highlighted in a webinar. So thanks for that question. 
All right, so uh, let me see. I might have to scroll back up a minute because I'm losing some questions right out of that. Yeah. Um, Chris says, I got my stimulus check. We'll be signing up for a TSA membership and buying a few things. Hey, thanks, Chris. Uh, so yes, you know, the TSA needs everyone's help as much as ever right now. You know, uh, our programs are under the same uh, um, pressures that everyone else is around the world. Uh, we And we are very empathetic towards everyone. Uh, at the same time, we still have turtles that rely on us for their survival. So uh, thank you very much for becoming a member because that membership goes directly towards helping our field programs. Um, and then yes, our online store is open. So please check that out at turtlesurvival.org. Click on store. Uh, we have a sale going on right now. So please check out some items that are for sale. Um, let's see. Uh, thank you all very much for telling me that these webinars are interesting and informative. I, I do really appreciate that feedback. Uh, Edward says, I have a Florida snapping turtle yearling. How old before you can sex it? Um, th so the sex of the turtle really depends on size rather than age. Um, so uh, a turtle that is four years old may be the same size as a turtle that is two years old. It really just depends on the growth of that animal. And so being able to uh, observe what's called the secondary sex characteristics of your snapping turtle is really gonna depend on size. Now with uh, Florida snapping turtles or Eastern snapping turtles, uh, you can normally start to see those sexual sex characteristics uh, by the time uh, they're uh, about a small dinner plate. Um, and what you are specifically looking for uh, with that species is the cloaca, the urogenital opening to basically what we call migrate down the tail uh, and away from the bottom uh, edge of the plastron. Um, Boris says, regarding sea turtles, would it be possible that the hatchlings hatch and escape a few days earlier in order to prevent drowning if a very high tide is expected? So, yes, absolutely, uh, Greg. So, um, turtles like sea turtles uh, who, have a, uh, who have a pliable or what we call soft shell um, are very susceptible to drowning at late stage of embryonic development if the nest is covered by a high tide. Um, so uh, your highest tides, uh, which are called king tides, uh, typically like for us on the uh, eastern seaboard of the United States um, and throughout the Atlantic occur during uh, late summer and early fall. So typically late August, September, October. And that is also the same time that a lot of these sea turtles are hatching out. Um, so uh, with water inundation, that may trigger um, the, uh, the hatchlings to hatch. Uh, it would be in their benefit to hatch uh, prior to those tides rising. But again, a tide, you know, tidal shifts and uh, the tidal amplitude, the height uh, in which the tide rises, is a daily process. So that is very much an environmental cue. So as that tide slowly rises towards the nest, it is again going to change the pressure within the nest. Um, that pressure is going to change uh, the amount of available oxygen in the sand. Um, and, uh, and then it will also change the humidity within the sand as water leaches uh, into the nest cavity. So yes, that could very much be a trigger. Uh, really good because again, if the nest becomes inundated by salt water for too long, um, it will cause the embryos uh, anoxia and they will drown within the eggs. Okay, so Greg says swin hose soft shell. Exactly. So the Yangtze giant soft shell turtle, Raphidus swin hoi, is also known as the swin hose soft shell turtle. Excellent. Um, Lucas asks, 
About hatchlings, how important is vitamin A for a tortoise hatchling in captivity? So vitamin A uh, is uh, a, a very important vitamin. Um, you know, there's numerous vitamins and minerals that are critical for turtle health, uh, growth, and longevity. Uh, vitamin A is one of those. Uh, so make sure when you're looking at your diet plan that you are getting uh, a very diverse diet and uh, dietary items that do provide your different uh, vitamins in the amounts that are beneficial to the animal. So such as vitamin A or vitamin B or vitamin C uh, or vitamin K, potassium. Um, Greg says, TSA is my beneficiary when I die. Nobody else deserves it. Greg, that is, uh, I hope you don't go dying anytime soon because, well, I, I love that you're a turtle lover and I love seeing you and interacting with you on these webinars. But, you know, if you would love to have the Turtle Survival Alliance as your beneficiary when that uh, sad day comes, um, I, I would personally, uh, I would love that um, because, the work we do here is second to none. Um, I, I don't. I don't really know uh, of uh, of a program on earth that collect collectively does as much as we can to help turtles and tortoises around the world. All right, so um, let's uh, move on really quick. Again, you've seen this before if you've seen these webinars, but if you want to learn more about all this. Get a turtle book, uh, read scientific journal articles. I read scientific journal articles all the time, um, and, uh, and, and they'll just really increase your knowledge capacity. Um, uh, there's a lot of books. If you want to know the ones that I really gravitated towards uh, while growing up, it was Archie Carr's Handbook of Turtles. It was Turtles of the World by Carl Ernst. Uh, Turtles of the United States in Canada by Carl uh, uh, Ernst, Roger Barber, and Jeffrey Lovich, and uh, then Year of the Turtle by David Carroll. Those were the ones that really, really influenced me as a uh, uh, as a, not only a youth, but still influenced me to this day. Uh, again, follow us on social media. Uh, when the time comes again, volunteer with a turtle project. Or if you have any questions or want to learn how you can get involved, please email me right there, jgray at turtlesurvival.org, and I'd love to talk to you. I know I was just chatting with Lucas in Brazil, um, uh, as well as Boris um, there in, uh, the other day. Um, again, get involved. Be uh, volunteer with a program. Uh, become a TSA member, support a TSA program. These are all ways in which not only you can get involved, you can learn, but you will directly help zero turtle extinctions. Uh, no more turtles will go extinct off the face of this earth if we do what we can together to save these incredible prehistoric animals. Uh, and then lastly, check us out on social media. Sorry, that was a time lag because I'm reading the comments. Again, thank you all so much for, for joining in. Uh, uh, Kelly asked, Jordan, do you have a specific source for your scientific articles? I typically look up a topic I'm interested in and then uh, find a some journal article that is related to it. Um, there are many avenues in which you can get these articles, whether it's through ResearchGate or JSTOR. Uh, many of these avenues require either you to have an account. Some of them are a free account. Some are a paid account. Uh, but some of these articles are also available uh, for downloadable PDF uh, uh, free to the public. And so those are some of the ways. But uh, man... Nothing makes me have a wilder Saturday night than a good glass of milk and a scientific journal article. Uh, so please, yeah, check us out on our website, on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter, at Turtle Survival. If you have any turtle pictures that you want to share with us, just tag us, at Turtle Survival. 
Um, oh, Greg, awesome. So you have half of the books uh, that you own are turtle books. That's awesome. Uh, you volunteered with Dr. Bar Barbara Bonner in Massachusetts before she passed. Excellent. We actually have a lot of turtles from uh, the Barbara Bonner Trust at our Turtle Survival Center. So uh, her legacy continues to live on through our breeding assurance colonies there at the Turtle Survival Center. Um, so again, I'm going to leave you with a dog riding a tortoise because we all need a little bit of humor in our life. Thank you all very much for attending. Again, I know these webinars can be um, lengthy, but I just love talking about turtles. I see that you all love uh, commenting, uh, uh, asking questions, and responding. So thank you all for staying with me. Again, go back and watch the webinar if you had to leave at any point or if there's something you want to go back and learn in more detail. Uh, but for now, thank you all very, very much. Um, oh yes, Greg says, uh, I know you keep the location secure. Yes, our Turtle Survival Center is in a hidden and secure location, uh, but that also goes for no matter where you are looking for turtles or other species that could be endangered by people, please make sure you have your locationing services off on your cellular uh, device as well as any type of professional camera because it is so important that we um, uh, keep the locations of these animals secret from any nayer do wells. With that being said, T-U-R-T-L-E knowledge is T-U-R-T-L-E power. Jordan Gray signing off. I'll see you soon.